when we go to the store and we want to purchase, say, a loaf of bread or a sweater, we take our dollars and we go to the store and we buy them. If a company, however, wants to purchase goods and services produced overseas, they have to make two transactions. Number one, they have to buy the currency of that country, and then number two, they make the transaction for the good or service. So what we're going to talk about today is foreign currency and the buying and selling of foreign currency. Usually when we think of a market, we think of a buyer and seller, and we think of a demander and a supplier. However, every exchange really includes two people who are both demanders and suppliers of some good or service. For example, when I go to buy a gallon of milk, I am a demander of milk. But at that same time, I'm also a supplier of dollars. So every transaction includes both parties or more than two parties as both suppliers and demanders of some good or service. So looking at the foreign exchange market, we look at the market for dollars, we're going to look at a typical supply and demand market. We have a demand curve that slopes downward. As you, So this will be the market for pesos, uh, the market for dollars in terms of pesos. As you require fewer do pesos per dollar, you're going to demand more dollars. On the flip side, the more pesos you're willing to give me for dollars, the more dollars I'm willing to supply to the market. In this case here, the equilibrium is 20 pesos per dollar, and $100 are being transacted in this market. Now on the flip side is the market for pesos. Again, if you are a supplier of dollars, you are at the same time a demander of pesos. And on the opposite side, if you are a demander of dollars, you are on the flip side a supplier of pesos. And in this case here now, we see that it's 20 pesos per dollar. The inverse of that is going to be 5 cents per peso, 1 20th of a dollar. Now, in looking at this, if we have $100 being transacted in the market at $20 per peso, then that means we must be dealing in 2,000 pesos in this market here. So in both markets, we're looking at the market for dollars, where we have demanders of dollars and suppliers of dollars. They are the inverse in the market for pesos. Someone who is a demander of dollars is also a supplier of pesos. Somebody who is a supplier of dollars is a demander of pesos. When we look at the supply and demand for foreign currency, it's a derived demand in that the demand for a country's currency depends on the goods, services, and assets that are being purchased. The more goods and services or assets that are being purchased from a certain country, then the more people need that currency. So before I can buy, say, a French chapeau, I first must buy euros. Things that will shift the demand for a nation's currency are, number one, changes in the real interest rate. If real interest rates in Mexico are greater than they are in the United States, then investors in the United States holding everything risk constant, investors in the United States are want to, going to want to purchase Mexican financial assets, and that's going to increase the demand for pesos, which will cause an, a, an appreciation of the peso relative to the dollar, or will cause a depreciation of the dollar relative to the peso. Changes in domestic income as a country becomes wealthier, Imports are a normal good. Therefore, people are going to purchase more imports, which means they're going to need the currency of foreign countries. Therefore, the demand for those currencies is going to go up. The price of those currencies are going to go up. So there is a depreciation of the domestic currency relative to the foreign currency or an increase in the, uh, the appreciation of the foreign currency relative to the domestic currency. Changes in prices. As prices in a country go up, they become more costly to purchase relative to those same products purchased elsewhere. Again, we're looking at relative prices. Prices in the U.S. may go up. Prices in France stay the same. Therefore, we're going to demand more euro so we can buy the goods produced in France, holding, again, other factors constant, such as transportation costs, risk, things like that. And the last one we're going to look at is changes in technology. As a country becomes more productive or the workers become more productive, they can produce goods at a lower cost. Therefore, those goods become cheaper and therefore the demand for that currency is going to go up and you'll see an appreciation of the, the domestic currency as they adopt new technology or new technological process causes labor to be more productive. So let's look at a market here. Let's say it's the market for uh, dollars and for the peso dollar exchange rate. What happens in this market is incomes in Mexico increase. So workers in Mexico start earning more, they're more productive, their incomes increase, imports are normal goods, so Mexicans demand more of our goods, they want to get imports from the U.S., therefore to buy the goods they first must obtain dollars. 
So here we look at our market for the peso and the dollar. The, again, the market for dollars on the left, market for pesos on the right. The Mexican nationals want to buy U.S. goods, therefore they demand more dollars. That causes the demand for dollars to increase. And now the exchange rate is 25 pesos per dollar instead of 20. It now costs Mexican nationals 25 pesos to obtain a dollar rather than 20. At the same time, the supply of pesos increases, which means on the inverse of this, you now get 4 cents per peso instead of 5 cents per peso. And there are now 3,000 pesos being transacted in this market. Before it was 20 pesos per dollar at uh, $100, so that was 2,000 pesos. Now it's 25 pesos per dollar with $120, therefore it's 3,000 pesos. This is similar to what happens when there's political unrest in Mexico. As this happens, people who are investing in Mexico want to flee because of the political unrest. Their investment investments become riskier, so investors want to flee Mexico. They sell off their Mexican financial assets and begin to buy U.S. financial assets, so therefore they demand dollars, and it's no different than the last example we just talked about with incomes in Mexico. If Mexicans want to decrease their holdings of their own financial assets, they're going to sell, or other foreign investors who are invested in Mexico want to sell off their financial assets, that's going to be an increase in the supply of pesos and an increase in the demand for dollars, and you'll have a depreciation of the peso relative to the dollar. Most foreign currency transactions, again, are in financial assets, not in goods and services. So what happens in this market is U.S. residents find it more lucrative to invest in Mexicans' financial assets. So in other words, we can say the real interest rate in Mexico increased, and therefore holding risk constant, more people want to invest in Mexican financial assets. Well, to buy these assets, they first need pesos, and this means that the supply of dollars increases and the demand for pesos increases. So here we have the supply of dollars increasing, and now instead of 20 pesos per dollar, it's only 16 pesos per dollar. All right, so the supply of dollars increases. Before I'd been getting 20 pesos for my dollar. Now I'm getting 16, and this means the demand for pesos has increased, and now it's 6.25 cents per peso. Now you have $125 being transacted in this market at 16 pesos per dollar. That's 1,920 pesos. So again, looking at this intuitively, an increase in the supply of dollars in order to buy, in the foreign currency market, in order to buy Mexican assets is similar, uh, similarly a increase in the demand for pesos in order to buy those assets. And so we look at the exact thing we had before at six and a quarter cents per peso. There are $125 being transacted into this market. That's 2,000 pesos being transacted. What happens in the foreign currency market as a result of Fed policy to lower interest rates in the U.S.? This would be expansionary monetary policy. So the lower rates make it less attractive for foreigners to invest in U.S. financial assets. Fed policy, in this case here, again, it's expansionary. It's going to lead to a lower interest rate in the U.S. relative to other countries. And their U.S. residents now want to hold more foreign assets as opposed to U.S. assets. And this is really not much different. But now you have a decrease in the demand for dollars because foreigners do not want to hold dollars. And you have an increase in the supply uh, or decrease in the supply of pesos because now they're not wanting to buy so many U.S. financial assets. So now the exchange rate went from 20 pesos per dollar to 16 pesos per dollar. Or again, the alternative is six and a quarter cents per peso. And we end up with exactly the same as we had before. Uh, in this case here, since we do have this shifting actually in the demand for dollars downward and an a decrease in the supply of pesos, we now have fewer pesos being transacted in this market. So what happens in the foreign currency market is inflation in Mexico increases substantially. And again, this means that it's more costly for Americans to buy Mexican imports or Mexican exports falls. They're now going to be producing fewer exports because their prices are higher. People are not buying these. This means U.S. residents need fewer pesos. So in looking at the same thing again, we have a decrease in supply of dollars. Americans are not going to be buying the Mexican pesos. This leads to a decrease in the demand for pesos. And now, like with the first example, it's four cents per peso. We have 1,600 pesos being sold in this market or being purchased in this market. Now, one more example I want to look at. 
let's use a different country, let's use China, what happens to the exchange rate between the dollars and the Chinese yuan as Chinese investors lose faith in the security of U.S. investments? There has been talk that the U.S. can simply default on their uh, debt to, the, to foreign nations, especially the Chinese, or Donald Trump is talking a lot about pulling out any type or trying to reconfigure any sort of trade deals to stop the um, trade deficit. That's a whole other example we won't get into here. But what happens now when Chinese investors lose faith in the security of their investments? They invest a lot in the U.S. They may be concerned about the security of those investments. Well, we'll look at the market for dollars again on the left and the market for yuan on the right. We're going to say it's eight yuan per dollar or dollar twenty-five per yuan. One hundred dollars being transacted in the market at eight yuan per dollar. That means it's eight hundred yuan being transacted in this market. So we see the demand for dollars decreases, and now we go to six and a quarter yuan per dollar instead of eight yuan per dollar. A decrease in the demand for dollars is no different than a decrease in the supply of yuan. They're now not willing to purchase as many U.S. financial assets. That means it's now a dollar sixty per yuan instead of I mean sixteen cents per yuan instead of uh, twelve and a half cents per yuan, and therefore it's five hundred yuan now being transacted in this market. And looking at the same thing we had before. So one other thing I want to look at now is we want to look at the real exchange rate. Suppose a Big Mac sells for $4 in the U.S. For how many pesos should it sell in Mexico if the exchange rate is 20 pesos per dollar? In other words, let's assume there is zero transactions costs, zero information costs. If you live on the border, say you live in San Ysidro, California, you can easily go to Mexico to buy a Big Mac if you choose. If a Big Mac would cost you $4 in the United States, or it would cost you something different in Mexico, and assuming an exchange rate of 20 pesos per dollar, where should you buy it? Well, in this case here, we're going to see that if it sells for anything less than 80 pesos, it's cheaper for an American to go to Mexico or for a Mexican not to come to the U.S. If it's more expensive than 80 pesos, it's the reverse. A Big Mac should sell for the same amount all over the world, controlling for the exchange rate. Now this is what's called the Big Mac Index. It's put out by The Economist every year, and they want to compare what's called purchasing power parity. So let's take a look at this. The real exchange rate is, in this configuration, it's the dollars per peso times the price in Mexico divided by the price in the U.S., and in the long run, that should equal one. So for example, if the dollar exchange rate for the peso is five cents, and the Big Mac is four dollars, then that means in the long run, the price in Mexico for a Big Mac must equal 80 pesos. If it's not, if R is less than 1, in other words, if it costs more than 80 pesos, then the dollar is undervalued. You should see a, an appreciation of the dollar to cover this. If the, if the real exchange rate is less than 1, then it's saying the dollar is overvalued. This means that the price in the U.S. is greater and people could do, would be better off going to, the, uh, going to Mexico to buy the good and therefore you would see that the value of the dollar depreciate over the long run. That's the end for this lecture on foreign exchange. Next one we'll talk about is the, uh, uh, the balance of payments.